My name is Paul Stum, and I have the privilege of serving as the 26th president of Cumberland University. And I very much appreciate each one of you coming out and being a part of our ceremony today. I want to thank the 129th Army Band. Thank you all. Please join me in thanking them. I want to recognize a few trustees of the university who are here today. We have trustees Rob Porter, Joe Adams. If you'll stand when I call your name, many of you I think are already standing over here. That's okay. But, uh, Michael Moscardelli. Captain Robert Carver Bone, Colonel Sam Hatcher, Lieutenant John Van Maul, and Miss Jackie Cowden, who's here with her father, who is a veteran, Mr. Lawrence West. Thank you all for being with us today. I believe they're on their way in right now. The two gentlemen whom we believe are the oldest living alums of Cumberland University, Dr. Gordon Petty, and Mr. James Bass. And I want you all to know they are, they are the young age of 99 and 98 years old, respectively. They served, respectively, in the Army and the Navy in World War II, and they were roommates when they were here at Cumberland University. I want to recognize a few elected officials who are not on the platform with us today. I'm going to recognize the platform party in a few minutes but I need to recognize County Mayor Randall Hutto, who's here somewhere. Mayor, there he is. Mayor, thank you. Uh, I want to give special thanks to two other people who are here. Uh, Heather, Heather Bay and her husband Carrie, I saw Heather earlier. She and Korean War veteran Jack Cato, who's sitting right over here. Jack Cato served as a mine sweep, a human mine sweeper in the Korean War. He's only 89 years old, a youngster. Uh, but Jack Cato and Heather Bay are largely responsible for the financing of this project, and we want to thank them. There's one other person I want to thank, and I haven't seen him, but I bet he's here, and that is Pete Norman. Pete, are you here? Where is he? Front row. Pete Norman, right here. Cavalry. Pete Norman is a veteran. He was a helicopter pilot in the Vietnam War. And I, but I want to recognize him for two reasons, and he doesn't know that I'm going to do this, but I want to recognize him, one, because he is a veteran, and he served our country with distinction, but he continues to serve our community, and particularly the veterans of our community. And Pete, for that, we thank you. But the second reason I want to recognize Pete Norman is because of his nickname. Does anybody know what his nickname is? Uncle Pete, that's right. Everybody calls him Uncle Pete. But I want to tell you about another Uncle Pete very briefly. Because I too had an Uncle Pete. I had an Uncle Pete Cavert. And my Uncle Pete Cavert was right here in Lebanon, Tennessee in 1943. He was part of what they called the Blue Army when they had the Blue and Red Army who trained as part of the World War II maneuvers. My Uncle Pete was deployed to Europe and he was in Europe in 1944, and exactly 75 years and two days ago, on 09 November 1944, my Uncle Pete was killed in action in Metz, France. Now, I never knew my Uncle Pete, but I knew a lot about him. And I want you all to know that we all have Uncle Pete's. We have Uncle Pete's like Pete Norman, who served with distinction and have come home to us and continue to serve. And I thank those of you who are in that category. And we also know Uncle Pete's like my Uncle Pete Cavert, who didn't return, but nevertheless served with distinction. And his remains today are in a World War II cemetery in France. God, we thank you for this day. Today is a day to remember those who put everything on the line we sacrificed more than they could ever imagine for something bigger than themselves. And by the help of God, they made it back home. And God has blessed those that didn't. We thank all who have served and protected our freedom. We thank those who have served in the past and those in the present and those who are yet to serve. We have thanked those who have served during times of peace and during times of unrest. Lord, we ask that you bless these men and women. We ask that you heal them. And in your name we pray. 
Amen. Filling in for Representative Susan Lynn, not nearly as pretty as she is, but uh, we have our city mayor, Bernie Ash. Mayor Ash, a veteran, too. We have uh, Army retired veteran, uh, Representative Clark Boyd. Senator Mark Pody. Lieutenant Colonel Jim Henderson. Lieutenant Colonel Sabrina C. Colonel Jerry McFarland. And then over to my right, I'll start with the far end. You've already met student, Cumberland student Michael McCluskey, both of whose parents are veterans. Colonel Sean Cody, from whom you'll hear in a few minutes. Brigadier General Kurt Winstead, from whom you'll hear in a few minutes. Major General Jeff Holmes, from whom you'll hear in a few minutes. And Commissioner Courtney Rogers, from whom you'll hear in a few minutes. I'll now ask Colonel McFarland to come to the podium. Good morning, one and all, and thank you for being here today for the rededication of the World War II Maneuvers Monument and a special thanks to my friend Jim Anderson, who at that time, uh, from 1991 to 1995, served as the president of the commission, the state commission, whose office was here at Cumberland University and provided so much information out to our schools and churches uh, during that time period when the maneuvers were here. Let's talk about the maneuvers for just a few moments. World War I ended, peace was abound across the world for 20 years, and then all of a sudden the war clouds came and descended upon Europe, came and descended upon the Pacific Theater. The Nazi Germans had taken Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Low Countries, moving into France, and then the East, the Far East, the Japanese Empire had moved into China, French Indochina, the island realm of the Pacific. And our country was still in a state of pacifism. We did nothing, absolutely nothing. Then in 1941, very early in the spring, the Congress and the President of the United States, President Roosevelt, said, we've got to get on a war footing. And they did. And they mobilized all of the Guard divisions, all of the Reserve divisions, created new divisions, created Army groups, created Corps commands, division commands, and it was on. 94 divisions was created. 94 divisions, just think of that. All those 94 divisions, 25 of those divisions were selected to come right through Middle Tennessee. Over 25% of the United States Army came here for training uh, during that time period. Let's talk about the individual soldiers just a minute. Small unit tactics. When old soldiers got here, they learned how to fire weapons. They learned how to uh, maneuver by fire and maneuver uh, techniques. But nobody, nobody, none of the commanders had moved large-scale armies on the battlefield since World War One. We're talking about moving hundreds of thousands of people. There were three large-scale maneuvers, the largest of which was in Louisiana. The Louisiana maneuvers contained about 1,300,000 soldiers. The second largest was in Tennessee, about 850,000 soldiers. That's huge, especially when Lebanon, Tennessee, only had a population of 2,900. That was huge. And then, of course, the California maneuvers, about 600,000. That was primarily for desert training. But it played such a hard part on the civilians and the soldiers alike. Training was hard. Training was tough. One soldier came out of, out of the Burma Theater, returned for, with Merrill Marauders, and said, an individual asked him, said, was, was it bad in Burma? Was it bad in the jungle? He said, you think this is bad? You should have been in the Tennessee Maneuvers. It was tough. Two hundred and 68 soldiers and nine civilians died during that training period. 
due to accidents, ordinance, tanks rolling over them. There's 268 flags around this monument to represent those 268 people. The last night of the last maneuver, the 26th Division, which made up the Massachusetts National Guard, they were actually the trains of the rear element of them was just leaving Lebanon on the Hartsville Pike. And the advance element was all the way down at Abrams Ferry. Bumper to bumper trucks, troops marching on the side of the road. Lieutenant Colonel Coley said, we have got to cross this river. The ferry master at Avery Ferry said, don't cross that river, it's too dangerous. We're in flood stage, full grown trees are floating down the river, too dangerous. Somebody's gonna die. But he said, if this is combat condition, we'd have to cross this river and we're going to. And they made several crossings, but something bad happened. 23 soldiers got in a boat with a 60 millimeter motor, motor, fully loaded down, and started across the river. Sometime in the late night of the 22nd of March, or early morning of the 23rd of March of 44. Somewhere in the middle of the river, something tragic happened. Nobody really knows. But 23 people went into the water, two came out alive, 23, excuse me, 22 bodies recovered. Sergeant First Class Jacob Jack is still with us. His, his remains were never recovered. The first soldier that was recovered during that terrible accident was carrying a rifle, an M1 rifle. That M1 rifle is here today. It was brought here especially for this occasion. Uh, Sergeant Ezell is carrying that rifle and you're more than welcome to go and see it after the ceremony. But that's kind of what took place. It was a terribly, terribly hard time on civilians and soldiers alike. And so now that you have that setting of what took place here, and this was Second Army Headquarters, the General Headquarters are right here. And they fanned out across 21 counties in Middle Tennessee to perform their duties. With that saying, we're going to have the rededication of the monument, and I'll turn it back to uh, President Stone. Right. It's my privilege now to introduce to you all again State Commissioner of Veterans Affairs, Courtney Rogers. I should mention that Ms. Commissioner Rogers has a son who graduated from Cumberland last year and is now here in graduate school, Michael. So, Commissioner, glad to have you. Okay, thank you and good morning, and it's a real privilege for me to be here, especially because I get a chance to give a shout out to my son, who I'm sure is ducking where I can't see him, for the shameless mom plug. But we are very proud that he comes here to Cumberland. Um, and I'm so thankful for today. It is so important to recognize the service of our veterans. You know, they gave up some of their own freedoms. They knew they would be called upon to sacrifice their own lives, and they did that to protect our freedoms and our lives. And this is deserving of remembrance. Um, military action catalogs incredible decision points in our country. For World War II, it was a fight for the right of self-determination for ourselves and for our allies. Americans value freedom, independence, and our nation's sovereignty. And the actions of our greatest generation and for those that followed, accentuate those values by demonstrating what they're willing to sacrifice to preserve them. The story of Averitt's Ferry is personal. It happened here. I cannot imagine being a student here and seeing all that they have seen. What a story that would be. Now, I have met many World War II veterans and women from Tennessee. We are the land of the volunteers and none were boastful. Matter of fact, oftentimes all I could get was a short statement as to where they served, and it was up to me to figure out the rest. I'm gonna give you two stories. Mr. Edward Brucus told me that he was in the Battle of Tinian, and that was it. It was fought in the Marian Marianas Islands in the Pacific in the summer of 44. It was a key objective for the 12th Air Force because we were trying to extend our range. It was defended by 9,000 Japanese troops, and it ended as one of the most successful U.S. amphibious landings of the Pacific War. And the island was conquered in a single week. It took many young American lives to do that. 
but Mr. Mitchell D. Lewis, Sr., told me, in the contrast, that he was at the siege of Bastogne in Belgium in December of 44, quite a different climate. But he was part of the larger Battle of the Bulge, the last major German offensive on the Western force, and the largest single battle fought by the United States in World War II. Mr. Lewis had been a scout, and he had been caught between enemy and friendly lines. He could not get up. He was literally frozen into place for three days. And because of it, below his knees remained black for the rest of his life. Though miraculously, they were functional. He had a great career um, as a lineman. But both of these men just live um, just down the road from here. I know we have other World War II veterans here today, Dr. Gordon Petty, Mr. James Bass, and others here today. Um, could you all just wave one more time and let me see you? Let me see you. Thank you for all that you have given. Thank you for being the greatest of examples for the rest of us to follow. My final note to all veterans here today, like the story of Cumberland, your stories make history real for future generations. They can read the headlines, they can read the timelines, and they can count casualties, but it is the personal stories that bridge our generations. So no matter how big or how small you believe your military contribution was or is, record your stories because they represent a page in history if for no one else than for your families to pass down. But your story has a message and a mission. Thank you, Cumberland, for your role in preserving our history and keeping it alive and for honoring veterans. I am so grateful. God bless our veterans, the faculty, the staff, our students of Cumberland University, especially my son, and God bless America. Thank you. First of all, I'm in awe to be with uh, just among our greatest generation uh, and all our all our veterans. It's uh, this is a special day, and I think uh, there's no doubt in this country we've got a lot of holidays spread out throughout the year. But I think that there are at least a couple that should hold and do hold the highest honor, and this is one of those days. As Ron and I were driving in this morning, we went through a number of school zones, slowing down to 15 miles an hour and so forth. And I was sitting there thinking. You know, these, these kids are going to school and maybe they should be off because this is an honorable day of remembrance. But then we started thinking about it. What would those kids be doing if they weren't in school? Out riding their bike, you know, doing something, probably watching TV or playing Nintendo or something like that. But what they're doing in school right now at some point today is they're having a Veterans Day event. Every school across this nation is having a Veterans Day event, but maybe they already had it. You know, and I'm thinking that's where our youth need to be because the importance of passing that patriotic gene down to the next generation is vital to this country. That's what's occurring all weekend, and it's what's occurring today. So that's vitally important. So I'm okay with these kids going to school today. So the greatest generation, um, it's really astonishing what our country was able to do in World War II. I cannot imagine creating a million man army with the startings of 173,000 active army at the time. Eight million soldiers that were trained and became the most competent, most powerful land force in the world and you're taking civilians and creating soldiers of those. That's, that's pretty astonishing. The process that was used back then is not lost on the soldiers in the formations today. Tennessee maneuvers tested formations down from the platoon, squad, individual level, all the way up to army group level. Significant events, each one of those echelons trained at various times, but putting all of those formations together at one time was truly the test. We still do that today. We do that at the National Training Center in California, the, the JRTC at Fort Polk, Owen Fields in Germany, Udari Range Complex in Kuwait. We still do that today before these units are deployed. They go through what's called the mission rehearsal exercise. 
which is made up of everything that the Tennessee maneuvers did. And it was designed to create stress. And Colonel McFarland, you were right. The best training is though is that training that creates stress almost to a breaking point. Everything has to work together. Harsh environment, most realistic training, most dangerous training, that is the only way that you'll achieve and maintain the most powerful land force in the world. And it's dangerous work, it's not a carnival ride, you don't take a ticket, there's no safety barriers, there's no safety net. It's dangerous, dangerous work. And that's evident by the number of soldiers that we lose almost monthly training scenarios, training scenarios. And we want that environment to be so realistic, almost to the breaking point, where those soldiers, and I've had them tell me this, and I've had the same thought, just go ahead and deploy me, because it's got to be better than this. And that's exactly what we want. Number of soldiers um, are killed every month, just as the soldiers we lost in the Tennessee maneuvers. And that is the price that we pay for creating and maintaining the strongest land force in the world. Those soldiers are no less patriotic and they're lo no less American than, than any other soldier that's killed. They are making the sacrifice so that we can maintain and sustain the most powerful army in the world. Thank you. It's now my privilege to ask Commissioner Rogers and General Holmes to lay the wreath at the memorial. And if you all will please... Uh, I should have mentioned earlier, perhaps too, it is in the program, that uh, Commissioner Rogers is a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the United States Air Force. Distinguished veterans, especially our greatest generation. Uh, Colonel, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for inviting myself and my Command Sergeant Major Ryan of the 26 Yankee Brigade down here to be part of this historic event. When, I, uh, when we arrived yesterday, the Colonel grabbed us up and uh, we went out, uh, I know, more to size us up than anything else to see about the Yankees. He invited us down. And he asked if I had a speech ready, and I said, speech? No. And he got a little nervous, and I said, well, what do you think I should say? And he says, well, you should definitely thank the people, which we absolutely will. But at the end, he said, make sure you do it in a proper southern manner. So uh, I will endeavor to, uh, to do that. We are honored to represent the soldiers, both past and present, of the 26th Yankee Division. And on behalf of Major General Gary Keefe, the Adjutant General of Massachusetts, and every soldier in the Massachusetts National Guard, thank you so much for organizing this great memorial for this rededication and this dedication. I'd like to specifically thank everyone that had a part in this, especially Mr. and Mrs. Cato, Cumberland University, and Colonel McCord. We are here today to recognize the 21 soldiers that passed away during the very last field problem before going over to combat in the European theater. Those 21 soldiers were lost during a river crossing, which the 26 went on to conduct countless river crossings under General George Patton. He had 42 divisions, and his office was right there in the president's office when they were here during the maneuvers. And he would frequently mention his top three divisions the 26th was one of them. In fact, the 101st Engineer Battalion of the 26th Yankee Division produced the maps that allowed Patton to make the relief at Best Stone during the Battle of the Bund. I promise you that these soldiers' sacrifices were impactful to all who knew about them. They were part of the 104th, 104th Infantry Regiment, 26th Yankee Division. What happened at Averitt's Ferry on the 23rd of March 
stayed with those soldiers for the rest of their lives, and I promise you that the Sergeant Major and I will ensure that every soldier in the 26 knows of their sacrifice. We owe these soldiers and their families a debt we can never repay. The soldiers just didn't sacrifice one life. I believe they sacrificed two lives, the one they were living and the one they never had a chance to experience. So again, I'd like to just take a moment to do a round of applause for Colonel McFarland, Mr. and Mrs. Cato, and Cumberland University for all, for all you've done here today. I did have a different speech written until last night, and uh, I, I went through it to make sure I hit the mark. And uh, I, I just kept a couple quotes, three actually, that I thought were very impactful, especially after being with the Colonel and seeing how much this means to him and how much it, it impacted the community that all these soldiers were here and went on to World War II. From Pericles, when you look back and you do any speech in the military, the first thing you fall back on is Thucydides. In 425 BC, in Pericles, when he's addressing the Athenian soldiers, and he says, what you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. The sacrifices these men made here during training is part of the fabric of our character of the 26th Yankee Division. Abraham Lincoln, and you all know this, that this reminds me of an area in Pennsylvania where a monumental event occurred in a small town. And the burden was left on the town to support and recover after that. He went there that day and said, I quote, these brave men living and dead who struggle here have consecrated this ground far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, no long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. And that it rings true for these 21 soldiers. I'd like to end this before we do the, the, the official dedication with a quote from our British cousin, Winston Churchill. During the Battle of Britain, I quote, Never in the face of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. And I say that specifically for our World War II greatest generation. Thank you, everyone. Now what we will do, Sergeant, Command Sergeant Major Ryan will place one rose for each of the 21 names. Private Grover R. Biggs, Chris Well, Lee, Sergeant, Kenneth A. Dobler, First Lieutenant John E. Dunsky, Phyllis A. Edlinski, PFC, Richard Pollard, Grovner, Second Lieutenant, Bernard J. Jackamix, James R. Kirk, PFC, Leonard S. Kojak, PFC, Dominic V. Lavallo, Private, Edward C. Monchik, Tech 3. John Francis Netto, PFC. John J. Paisley, Sergeant. William J. Pettit, Corporal. Joseph Frank Plona, Staff Sergeant. John Poklowski, Sergeant. Leonard M. Silski, PFC. Arthur Sakura, PFC. John E. Smalcom, Private. Frederick Adolf Still, Jr., Tech Sergeant. Leroy C. Strand, Private. Private Strand was also a veteran of a tall and came back with a Purple Heart and passed away in these maneuvers. And to the two survivors, First Lieutenant Walford Nielsen and PFC Simon Norick. Thank you all for being with us on this special day.